Today, I'm using Crusader Kings 3 to answer a simple question. What if history was different? Not better or worse, just different. In this case, what if the Norman conquest of England didn't play out per the history books? What if an unsuspecting Welsh prince and his family eventually came out on top? The major players in this scenario are all driven, motivated, and powerful. Harold Hadrada invades England from the north while William the Bastard moves in from the south. And then there's poor Harold Godwinson, stuck between a rock and a hard place. Historically, he fended off the Viking invasion only to get shot in the face by some peasant archer at Hastings. William threw his body in the sea, allegedly, and marched his forces to London where he was crowned king. But none of that's important, because that's not what's going to happen today. These great leaders and their massive armies can do as they please, because I'm more concerned with this fella here, a lowly prince in northern Wales with dreams of grandeur. And so begins a tale of violence, love, heartbreak and redemption. The Saga of Wales. Before we dive in, let's just clear up what the point of making this is. A few weeks ago, I made a video about Legends of the Dead and I decided to lean into the aspect of Crusader Kings that appeals to me, the storyteller. To my surprise, people liked that angle, so here I am, doing it more. So the main focus is on the unexpected stories that crop up during the game. I'll be following one family and seeing what unlikely places they end up in. Here and there, I'll touch on certain mechanics, and I'm always keen to hear your input in the comments section. Your points could help a new player get to grips with the world of Crusader Kings. There'll be tales of greatness, miserable wretches, unforeseen consequences, and maybe even a little history lesson here and there. But enough mucking around. Let's kick off the saga of Wales, starting with chapter one, A Realm in Turmoil. Our story begins with Prince Bleven. He controlled a tidy plot of land in Northern Wales, and for many that would be enough. But a storm was brewing in England, and he could leverage it to his own gains. First order of business was to kill the Norman king. Oh, wait, scratch that, he's far too heavily guarded. First order of business, kill the English king. He'd deal with William later. The ploy gained momentum, and King Harold's destiny of being hit in the eyeball at Hastings was undone. He was laid low by a dagger in the dark. Phase one was complete, now for phase two. Breaking up the Norman conquest and nope, still too strong. Rather than lay in wait, Bleven wanted to keep the momentum of his plan going. So he turned his gaze to the King of Scotland, Malcolm. Now, Scotland was famously not at all that involved in the whole ordeal, but that meant only one thing to the Welsh Prince. Malcolm was clearly up to something, so he murdered him. William was still untouchable, but rather than let his blade go dull, Bleven murdered the new King of England. Boy, destabilizing a kingdom sure is easy, isn't it? Well, yes and no. The murder part, sure, walk in the park. But while Bleven believed this was causing turmoil amongst enemy ranks, only one thing was happening. William was casually strolling through England, and the only time someone opposed him, they mysteriously died. The Norman conquest was simpler than ever, and Bleven had been applying the same tactics back home. With a little bit of murder here and an invasion there, he conquered the rest of Wales. Taking note of this scrappy young go-getter, William, now King of England, called up Bleven to the big leagues, and enlisted his help fending off Harold Hadrada's mounting invasion. Obviously, William didn't know about all the plots and plans to murder him. To save face, Bleven marched his armies to England, but sort of hung back a bit from any potential battle. He wanted to look involved, but he didn't want to actually commit to helping his mortal nemesis. He was cozying up and getting close to the new king, and forming a fresh plan. It was around this time that Bleven also assassinated the Holy Roman Emperor. No one's really sure why. The entirety of Wales was under Bleven's rule, though informally. He didn't have the coin to become an ordained ruler, because that's quite expensive. He was funneling his entire country's economy into murdering random rulers. Before long, his countrymen started to see him for what he really is. A murderer, a tyrant, and just a bit of an ass. One vassal was particularly vocal. This cut deep as it was Bleven's own flesh and blood, his nephew, Meredith. Bleven decided to nip this little problem in the bud. And by that I meant he sent an assassin. Though the plot fell through, and an intense rivalry was fought. Wanting to be the bigger man, Bleven invited his nephew on a hunting trip. A way to say, sorry for trying to murder you. Though when the opportunity arose, he just couldn't help himself. He tried to kill him again, and failed. 
To iron out that little faux pas, he hosted a grand feast and invited Meredith. Dear nephew, sorry for trying to assassinate you, twice. Please come to my feast and I promise not to do it again. Now obviously, any sane person would have thrown this invitation in the fire. But it turns out Meredith wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed, and decided to come to the feast, lured on the promise that he wasn't going to be murdered. Meanwhile, Bledon was sharpening his murder weapons. During the feast, a prime opportunity arose. His nephew was alone, and he could oh so easily give him a bash across the head and dump his body in the sea. No, no, that's too crass. He wanted the mortal blow to be a stylish and elaborate coup de grace. Though, that all unraveled later when Bledon was outside taking a leak. His nephew decided to interrupt him and insult him, so Bledon stabbed him in the face. His trousers may have been down and he may have been slightly sodden in urine, but apart from those minor details, it was the perfect crime. Well, it would have been if the spy master hadn't seen the whole thing. Surely his silence could be bought if, oh no, Bledon's murdered him too. No one else at the feast mentioned it, but I'm sure they knew. In between the empty chairs and the fact that the prince was covered in blood, they definitely knew. One pesky cousin disposed of, but the landscape of Britain was about to change. As a plague had done something Blethyn never could. It had killed William the Conqueror. There was now a power vacuum in England and Normandy, with William's son sitting on both thrones. Blethyn enacted phase three of his grand plan. He killed them both. He would have gone for the third son, too, but believe it or not, he did draw the line at killing children. Despite thinking he was a master of secrecy, his ways were publicly known, and his people began to refer to him as the Butcher. This served only as a catalyst for an even more deranged descent into madness. As though a higher power was angry at Bledon, a plague swept across his land and decimated his people. The unhinged prince assumed this higher power was Scotland, so he murdered their king. Again, the dark thoughts crept into his dreams and he envisioned his nation paved with trees laden with corpses. This should have been a nightmare, but for him it was an aspiration. He decorated the rolling Welsh hills with carcasses and cadavers. Now, a lot of people aren't a fan of that sort of thing. The church definitely couldn't condone it. The Pope started handing out claims on Bledon's land, hoping a bold Catholic hero would put an end to the madness. Bledon grew more paranoid and lashed out at foreign leaders, though an even greater threat was brewing much closer to home. Up until now, there were two main families in Wales. Up north, Mathravel, Bledon's bloodline. Down south, however, there was the Morganuk household, led by Prince Cadogan. Cadogan wasn't too pleased with Bledon's rule. What with the murdering and mismanaged funds and corpse forests, can't blame him really. His family decided they want to go at it alone and started an independence war. Their forces overwhelmed Bledon's capital of Harlech and he was taken prisoner. Reluctantly, the tyrant prince agreed to their requests. But once he returned to the capital, he noticed something amiss. Excalibur, the legendary sword of King Arthur was missing from his collection. Granted, he didn't know he even had it up till now, but now it was gone, he wanted it back, and he'd shake the very earth to get it. He planned a grand heist to get it back from Cadogan's castle, but the scheme failed. He could have given up, but no. So began the great Welsh family feud. Now feuds in the game are interesting. Basically, there's a lot of role-playing flavour here as two warring dynasties go tit for tat, though it does have benefits. The side that quote-unquote win the feud receive a passive bonus to prestige, essentially a marker to the world that says don't tread on us. They usually get more intense as they rage on, but in the case of Bledon, they start at full throttle. See, Cadogan would start things off with some minor insults. His family members would have a good old laugh at their rival's expense. So Bledon responded in kind. He murdered Cadogan's wife. The now widowed prince took a few light jabs at Bledon's character, and these jabs were returned by the prince picking off the Morganug family one by one. The bodies were piling high, and it was clear to pretty much everyone that Bledon was just taking it way too far. The Pope got involved and excommunicated him, but this just stoked the fires further. As he sanctioned more murders against his rival's house, Bledon's health started to deteriorate. His body and frame grew fragile and his mental state declined. The fog in his mind grew ever thicker and his friends and families became distant, alien. He was stricken with cancer, but ordered the physician to take drastic measures. It cost him an eye, but bought him a few more years. And he'd spend that borrowed time exercising his favorite pastime, indiscriminate murder. 
In his final throes, he disinherited several of his sons, passing the crown to the child he'd molded in his own image. When he died, no one mourned. He would surely be burning in hell for his many, many sins, as the game so bluntly put it. But now, sitting atop the throne was Bledon II. He'd been forged into a weapon of intrigue by his grandfather, and there were fears that this new king would follow the same path. But there was one key difference between the two men. His grandson was a lover, not a fighter. Though he'd still take what's rightfully his. He'd get it through the art of seduction, not by killing children. Oh yeah, that line I said Bledon wouldn't cross. He totally crossed it. Like, several, several times. God, what an awful human. Bledon II didn't want to be like his grandpa. His first act as a ruler was to end the ongoing blood feud. And everyone liked this. He had a penchant for underhanded dealings, but he wanted to be a good man. His inaugural covert operation was a scheme of seduction against his own wife. How wholesome. He held regular hunting trips with his vassals to improve relationships and show the locals that the Mathravel family weren't all murderers and maniacs. Though all those hunts cost a pretty penny, and his land wasn't all that wealthy, he needed some aid, so he packed his bags and paid the Pope a visit. So for Catholic rulers and Crusader kings, keeping a good relationship with His Holiness is important. Obviously for pious and moral reasons, sure, but mainly because the Pope is very rich. Every now and then you can request gold from him, and this is enough to keep your country ticking. Not to mention, if he deems you worthy, he'll provide you with claims that allow you to expand your kingdom. The difficult part of this is making him like you, because every ruler in Christendom will be trying to curry favour. With the right strategy, you can hold on. Oh, Pope Leo, you dog, lustful, fornicator, brothel frequenter, you dirty, dirty dog. Okay, change of plan. Bledon the Younger packed his bags and went to the Vatican. He was going to go bang the Pope. What started as a one time thing grew into a habit. Leo X would dispense gold and claims to Bledon, and in return, he'd receive some raucous Welsh lovemaking. This brought in an era of prosperity for the country. Feasts were commonplace and his vassals grew to like him. When the coffers ran dry, he'd nip back to Rome and pleasure his holiness. But everyone turned a blind eye, because it was with the Pope. In God's eyes, that's okay, right? Well, clearly God didn't agree, because after one such visit, he sent a plague to ravage Wales and punish Bledon for repeatedly bedding his most pious servant. The Malays claimed his son and then his wife. Bledon was stressed, repentant, and he had learned his lesson, but no one gave that memo to the plague. He died just a few months later, and passed on the realm to his 16-year-old son, Bledon III. And so began a new era of, oh no, he's dead too, ruled for 21 days. Okay, guess it's your turn, Meredith. Oh no, wait, another one died. Well, it lasted four months though, a lot longer than your brother, good job. After the crown had been passed around a few times, it landed at the feet of Ether Furch Bledon. The name is a bit of a mouthful, but it just means Ether, daughter of Bledon. I'm just gonna call her Ether. Most of her family lay dead. One by one, they'd succumbed to plague. This is, for any of you wondering, an example of just how devastating plagues can be in Crusader Kings. If you aren't prepared, they can decimate a family line. For Ether though, it was a fresh start. She'd be a new type of queen. Granted, the bar was set pretty low between her great-grandfather, the butcher, and her dad, the Pope f***er. She matured through her childhood and showed real promise. She gave birth to twins and married them off to form powerful alliances with Bohemia and Denmark. She'd call on these new friends to aid in conquering more of her homeland, eventually declaring herself formally as Queen of Wales. The bad blood between the two great families had almost entirely dissipated, and the Morganog family joined the new kingdom peacefully, offering the young queen their full support. Finally, after decades of misery and turmoil, the lands were won. Peace reigned. She had achieved what her ancestors had tried and failed to do, all before her 25th birthday. But the ambitions of those that came before her did not die. Wales was united, but it wasn't finished. England was growing ever turbulent and Ether was at a crossroads, able to take her budding new kingdom to great heights. Bledon I had dreamed of interfering in the Norman conquest and coming out on top, but failed, pretty miserably. His desire was to carve off a chunk of England and have it proudly fly the Welsh flag. Ether would go on to do much, much more. But that's a story for another day. When that day will be, I don't know, next week maybe? Be sure to hit that subscribe button to check out what the future slash past holds for young Queen Ether. 
For those of you that stuck around this long, thank you. This has been a lot of fun, and I am keen to hear your predictions of where you think Ether's story will lead. So leave a comment down below. Any of you who get really close, I'll give you a little shout out in the next video. But until then, stay good.